less than a month ago, there was a meeting in Europe for the very large uh, European Exposome or Exposure Science Program, which I think you'll hear more about, um, and I, I'll refer to it a little bit more. But Chris Wilde gave the opening there. I had no idea that he was going to call it on the origins of the Exposome, the prompt, the past, the promise, the perspective. So I guess he just also recently retired. Um, he's now a scientist emer emeritus at IARC, and I think that he saw that as an opportunity to um, kind of reflect a little bit. So I'm going to kind of do kind of the same kind of thing, and I hope that there'll be lots of questions um, later on. And I'm going to have to turn around so that I can see what I'm talking about. Oh, it's there. Thank you. And I don't even need my glasses. That's great. Okay. So I think everyone in this room who's interested in exposure knows today that our health is more than just our genome. And in fact, the Human Genome Project, starting in um, the 1990s and ending in 2001, where the first human genome was sequenced um, for $3 billion, um, you know, ended up giving us a good indication of the complexity of the human genome. In fact, initially, I think everybody thought it was simpler than we now know it is today. Because what we're beginning to understand as we bring in more, and remember those, that first genome that was sequenced was of a white male. And as we start getting more and more information, not only on the exome sequences, but on all um, the other kinds of sequences, especially the regulatory sequences, the regulatory sequences are the ones that really make a difference because, and I'm not going to talk about epigenetics in a sense, but it's the regulatory things that control what genes are turned on and what genes are turned off, and that's what really makes us different in chimpanzees given the fact that our structural genes are very, very highly conserved. So, but the point is, our genome is not the whole story, it's also our environment, which makes the difference. And we've already heard David talk a little bit about the complexity in the environment. And at NIHS, one thing that I think I kept stressing to people was our environment is not just synthetic chemicals. It's not just pesticides. It's not just agricultural chemicals. It's not just drugs. It's our food. Why people don't think that food is made up of chemicals and that they're going to impact how we respond to things? I I think we're beginning to think about it now. And of course, we know that our diet totally impacts our microbiome, and our microbiome totally impacts how we handle different kinds of stressors, and of course, the stressors in addition to the diet impact our microbiome. I think we want to, you know, people don't remember that stress is communicated by chemical messengers, for example, internal metabolomic kinds of things. Um, um, let's see. Oh, I forgot to put infectious agents on that. Um, I'm not thinking of the microbiome as infectious agents. But we know, especially now, as we fist bump instead of hug, that, you know, that viruses, bacteria are all around us, and we're dealing with them all the time, and we need to understand that they impact our ability to respond. And exposure to chemicals also obviously can impact um, can work the other way as well. So we know that air pollution or exposure to a whole bunch of adverse chemicals can actually suppress our immune systems as well. But the important thing is, again, is that everything is a mixture of genes and environment, environment broadly defined. So I think we're all aware of the fact that non-communicable non um, diseases are the largest cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Even in the developing world, they are growing in tremendous um, importance. And if we actually look at, for example, the percent that driven by different environmental factors, there's growing evidence that type 2, diabetes, two, type 2 diabetes is not mainly genetic. We know for, I mean, because you can't have um, health conditions like type 2 diabetes, like obesity, like certain kinds of, say, thyroid cancer, like certain kinds of neurodevelopmental disorders that are occurring at such higher prevalence than they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Our genes don't change that rapidly. So if we look at this, what we can see is, for example, 
heart disease, stroke, colon cancer. In fact, there was something on the news this morning, um, and I think many of you may be aware of the fact that, you know, colon cancer incidents, um, we keep finding more colon cancer in older people because we screen. We're not screening young people, and there is really an explosion of colon cancer in young people. And by young people, I mean people in their teens and their 20s. Um, and that can't be happening just because of genetics. There's got to be an environmental component in there. So kind of what led to the creation of the exposome? I think some of it is the, non, is the growing burden of the non-communicable diseases, um, the cost of treatment of these non-communicable diseases. I mean, a huge amount of our national budget is going to healthcare now, and a great, all right, right now, we're talking about eight billion for coronavirus. We spend lots more than that on chronic diseases um, every year. Um, we really have to think about the need for prevention, prevention um, as well as um, surveillance and early detection. And I think some of you have heard me talk about that, you know, what all of our grandmothers told us, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so I think we really want to be focusing on that and that we have, we need some knowledge of at least part of the causes or at least the promotion um, of certain kinds of diseases. So um, I think David or, or Bob already has mentioned Chris Wild um, and his paper in 2005 complementing the genome with an exposome, the outstanding challenge of environmental exposure, um, was focused on molecular epidemiology and really it was, it's very interesting because according to Chris told me that basically no one cared. The paper got published, and in fact, there was total anonymity. There was not one follow-up paper for 10 years, for, I'm sorry, for five years um, related to that. Now, I would say some of us were paying some attention. One of the first meetings I helped organize when I joined NIEHS in 2009 was we ran a program, and still do, about um, emerging environmental health issues at the National Academy. This is a series of workshops, and one of the first ones that we held was focusing on what I would call as the nascent exposome. Um, how do we begin to approach those issues? And there are reports from that. These are not your long National Academy consensus reports. It's just a, a report of the workshop, which you can find on the National Academy website. But we have to thank, I think, Steve Rappaport and Martin Smith for what I would say was the perspective that they wrote in science in 2010, which really focused on raising the concerns about the exposome. So they talked about total exposure from internal and external sources that impacts the internal chemical environment. It took taking advantage of all the growing panoply of ana analytical chemistry techniques and the met metabolomic um, methodologies. And I'm gonna come back to metabolomics a little bit later as well, because in some ways that's part of exposomics. And the development may help provide insights into new biomarkers, not only of exposure, but also of disease as well. And so I think everyone I'm sure in this audience is familiar with this paper because it really, I think, upped the ante and got a lot more interest in working with the esposome. Now this was all occurring at a time when there were a number of reports, some which were more, I would say, strategic than others. But there was first toxicology in the 21st century, which was the report that talked about moving into the development of rapid screening and um, alternative approaches for toxicology, given that there may be over 80,000 chemicals in commerce. That's a number that's used in the EU. I think they use 143,000 as a number. But the point is less than 20,000 have any data on them at all. So that we need to have better ways to do it. And then I'll talk about using 21st century science this was focusing really on risk assessment, and the point is why would we use 20th century science to make uh, policy decision making when we get into the 21st century? But in 2012, NIEHS and EPA co-sponsored a report done by the Academy that I had hoped would be very insightful, very strategic, looking at exposure science. And I had hoped it would focus more on exposomics. Okay, so when you're a sponsor of a National Academy, you don't control it. You can come up with the title, you can come up with the, um, the topic, but after that, it's hands off, just give us the money. 
um, and then you wait for what happens. So this is a very interesting report on exposure science. It wasn't focused where I had wanted to go, which is towards um, biomonitoring kind of approaches, both targeted and untargeted. It focused much more on the source to receptor links and how you would do that well. So it's got a lot of good stuff in it, but I wouldn't say it totally changed the field. So the exposome, I think, as we all know, is the totality of exposure from preconception to death and has some common elements that I think that we need to think about. You measure as much as you can. I mean, David, I think I'm repeating what you said a few minutes ago. Um, if you can't do the totality. At this point, we still can't do the totality of exposure. But if we do more than just a single chemical at a time or a single metabolomic product at a time, I think we've moved forward. You want to look at the multi-scale integration, and you want to identify, David, this is your slide, except it's different. <laughs> it looks different, but it's the same idea. Um, and an untargeted hypothesis-free assessment. So I think I've already made the point that we're all exposed to a whole variety of things. Um, a lot of the focus in environmental health sciences is looking at those um, chemicals, synthetic chemicals that are made, and they're widely dispersed in our environment. And I think unlike we used to think that you had to go to really high levels of exposure in order to get effects, we're beginning to find, you know, given the variability and susceptibility in the population for multiple reasons, we often find that we can see effects in association with exposures at, um, at low levels in the general population. As I've said, exposures don't occur one at a time. Um, when you talk about exposures, you know, exposures occur both in time and place, the multiplicity of exposures. So it's not just that you, you can have co-exposures that maybe result in something different than if you have sequential exposures, where exposure to compounds A alter how you respond to compounds B when you get it later on. And that's especially true when we're looking at developmental exposures, where you may get permanent changes in response capability from an early life exposure going forward. And again, the exposome is the totality of exposure. So um, Chris Wilde continued to publish on the exposome um, hypothesis, not only his initial groundbreaking 2005 paper, but in 2012, where again, he kind of broke up the different kinds of exposures we have to internal, um, looking at metabolites and endogenous compounds and the, the micro microbiome and so on but the general external, and that's more than just chemicals, the social, the educational, the psychosocial stress, and so on. And then some of the specific external, and Chris, Chris included things like radiation and infectious agent. So again, partly what I'm trying to do is give you where we've been coming from with all this input into our view of the exposome. And we have the whole complexity of the exposome. Again, the stressor and the source and the place and the time and the route of contact, distribution and the targets. And I'm, I'm always amazed that much of our biomonitoring, whether we're doing it untargeted or targeted, we often look in one biological matrix that's readily accessible. And we don't always know whether that matrix is representative or how it relates to the other organs in the body. And I think that's something that we might want to remind ourselves at times. I think we get insight into that. Nobody's talked much. Um, David focused on epi, and we're not talking much about tox, but if there's things that we're concerned about, we can usually understand that relationship by looking at where, say, unknowns might go, um, what tissues that they actually go to, and how they behave in our toxicology kind of experiments. But I, I guess... Some of you may know that I'm kind of hyped on PFAS chemicals right now, in part because North Carolina has tremendous exposure going on um, in the RTP area. And I think th there's very little data to know whether what we're seeing in serum is really telling us how much is in the brain or how much is in the lungs or how much is in other tissues. Anyway, I can answer questions about that later. Anyway. So, again, the whole importance of exposures and co-exposures, and then this is kind of a slide I've, I've often used when I talk about climate change, actually, and the impacts that are caused by climate change and some of the things so you have, but are all the climate change, the rising temperature, and yes, climate change is happening, 
I have to tell you that for the last couple of years at NIHS, all of our materials says the effects of climate on health. We don't say climate change, but the climate is changing, as we all know. Um, <laughs> So, so whether you talk about, for example, the increase in carbon dioxide levels, the rising temperature, the extremes, all these impact, for example, the uh, increasing temperature, you know, we're all finding changes in distribution of different vectors. I used to joke about malaria in Maine. It's not funny anymore because we're beginning to find the Anopheles mosquito. Um, for example, as, for, as far north as Massachusetts and Maine, but, you know, those things are happening. We know, for example, extreme heat actually kills people. And, of course, who are the people that it impacts most? It's the people who are le least able to deal with the problem. So, the, again, the importance, the importance of the multiplicity of exposure. So, if we talk about where we've been and kind of, this is still kind of past, but also leading into the present. So, from Chris Wilde's initial paper in 2005 and then the, a Rappaport and Smith perspective in 2010. There's been a lot of conceptualization that's gone on. We have the workshops and commentaries um, about the exposome and then starting to integrate and think we've got to look at both external um, as well as internal and response markers as well. And then we can go about with the different kinds of measurements that we have of the exposome. We have growing capacity. Um, whether, I mean, I think, David, your comments about the all of us cohort, a million person cohort, you're right. There's no, no way that we're ever going to be able to put $20,000 sensors on everybody, even on 100,000 people. So that we're going to have to begin to take advantage more and figure out ways that we can build into our smart watches and our smartphones different kind of monitoring devices, I think, as well as um, imputing information from nearness to other things. Um, we need to also talk about where some of the gaps are, and David talked about these, the validation, annotation, and throughput. And then some of the power of the exposome. So we have to demonstrate the proof of principle, and I think there's been some work along that line down. I'm going to mention it right now. Where's Dean Jones? Dean, can you raise your hand? Hey, Dean. Um, I'll never forget when there was a meeting maybe 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago, and you were telling me how you could see over 20,000, maybe it was 22,000 compounds or peaks, I should say, in 100 microliters of serum. And I was totally blown away by that number. Of course, you said, we don't know what a lot of them are. But if you start seeing certain peaks again and again and again, you start applying pattern recognition phenomenon actually initially so you decide which ones you want to spend more time and which ones um, you want to use. But anyhow, so now we're moving into the whole issue of um, untargeted discovery and different ways to use it. So as we go forward, really, um, how are we using and what are the, the approaches that we're going to be using with the exposome, both how that they'll be crosstalk with the exposome informing this information and the, the, the different kinds of studies informing the exposome. So epidemiology, mechanistic research, risk assessment, and citizen science, and I'm going to give an example of each one. So some of the challenges and the applications of the exposome, this is especially with epidemiology, um, are advancing and defining the exposome concept. Yeah, my eyes. No, I can read that. Integration of different stakeholder perspectives and the willingness of um, untargeted discovery, the technology things, which has to do with the different kinds of approaches we're going to use, and the frameworks for data-driven data and untargeted analyses. And we know that one of the issues here is when we're generating these humongous amount of data that we need really better st biostatistical and bioinformatics approaches to deal with the huge amount of data. And of course, there's um, a lot of work in that area going forward. And then we have the whole logistical areas. You know, again, as David said, and I'll repeat, we can only do what we can do. We keep pushing the boundaries. So when we want to do the totality of exposure, you know, with lifetimes and windows of sensitivity, and we have to look at what we can do prospective as well as retrospective. And I just urge anyone who's doing and taking biospecimens or maybe environmental specimens in studies today, save some samples that we can go back two years from now, five years from now, ten years ago, and ask questions that we haven't even thought of yet. 
I think that'd be important. And the other thing I will say is collaboration and data sharing. None of this can be done by a single investigator working in their own, at their own bench top or in their own laboratory. These kinds of um, data-driven discovery, untargeted approaches with large cohorts, or as large as you can get them, biospecimens have to be done in a collaborative fashion. So, I said mechanistic research was one of the going, going forward areas that we want to deal with. So, again, the uh, systems biology kind of approaches with the multi-omic in, um, integration, and I've already mentioned, you know, we keep, every time I hear about a new ohm, I kind of groan. You know, you've got the, pro, you know, you've got the microbiome, you've got the metabolome, you've got the exposome, and the genome, and the lipidome, and the epigenome, and the proteome, and um, the glycome. And I'm sure I'm forgetting the parasitome, the virome. I mean, but when people say that, they are at least, a, a, you know, at least saying, I understand that this is complex. I understand that we're looking at huge amounts of data that is going to have to be looked at. And with things like the um, All of Us cohort, you know, you're going to get to the point with personal kinds of omics that we're going to have to be able to focus on. We have our animal models, and as I say, our animal models provide a lot of biological plausibility for wh wh what we're looking at, and some of the questions that we can only answer really by association in our epi studies, we can provide at least proof of concept by some of our controlled animal studies. And then the whole issue of nature and nurture and altered susceptibility going forward. I would just remind you um, that risk assessment is not just hazard, it's the integration of hazard and exposure. I think um, especially the press and the media often forget that the two have to go together, saying that something has the potential to cause an effect. If there's no exposure, then you may not have that effect. So you have to look at that. Um, so I think there are many more hazard assessments that are done um, in the U.S. as well as, as in, in Europe, for example. And then again, often part of the problem is the exposure data is not what we would like it to be. It's often incomplete or, you know, I have to say this, and I hope no one here will take offense with some of the studies that have been done, but when you measure chemicals that are in a person who has cancer, if they're chemicals with short half-lives, that doesn't tell you anything about what caused the cancer. Because cancer has a law, has a latency. Even the shortest cancers have a multi-year latency. And we need to remember that you have to really look back in time to understand it. Now, my career was built on the dioxins and the PCBs and the brominated flame retardants and now the PFAS. A lot of those chemicals have long half life so I can talk about measuring it. <laughs> in someone with disease, but in many cases, we really need that temporal component, that perspective longitudinal approach, or at least try to get at it retrospectively. And then the fourth part of the exposome going forward is the need to get the community engaged. I think many of you have heard me say, you can't do environmental health work, health research, unless you work in and with the communities. It's not outreach. It's engagement from the beginning. And then citizen science is often a powerful way for us to generate additional exposure information, for example, from citizens. So there's this empowerment, it can lead to public health action, for example, and it can lead to reduction in exposure. I would say, someone said, am I gonna feel free to say things? Yes, yes, yes. And so I'll make the comment now that at this point in time in our country, if you want something to happen related to the environment, we have to generate market basket action. We have to get people involved and in saying they want something or they don't want something. The reason that BPA was removed from sippy cups and baby bottles was not because FDA was willing to act. It was because people stopped buying. They said, we don't want to buy that. Of course, we ended up with unfortunate substitutions, so now we've got BPS and BPAF and BPF and a whole bunch of things instead of BPA, and they may be just as bad. But anyhow, things move forward because populations act. <laughs>
So I've talked about the different kinds of mixture approaches that can be used, and I wanted to just refer to the whole EWAS kind of study Shirak Patel has been doing for at least 10 years, where he's been looking at large amounts of multiple exposure data. Often he takes it from, for example, um, where N. Haynes is measuring up to 300 different compounds, and he's looking for associations that he sees with certain kinds of disease states. But he talks about actually now making kind of the ball of where you can look at the mixtures, for example. So in this case, you can see PCBs are associated with nutrients. Well, that makes sense because most of our PCB exposure today comes from the food that we eat and the microcontamination of the food supply. Well, there's some association with PCB and demographics. That makes sense too. If you're living in a fish eating, highly fish eating community, you might have higher exposure than, say, people who don't eat, say, ve vegans uh, who don't eat any um, kinds of. Um, animal protein. So you can learn a lot from doing these kinds of studies, studies using kinds of a uh, display technique to look at the bioinformatic understanding. I've talked already about how exposures are more than just chemicals and more than just mixtures of chemicals. You know, it's amazing to me, but um, again, I'll use PFAS as an example. Um, there's a lot of talk, at least EPA is finally saying that they might actually regulate PFOA and PFOS, which are two of over 5,000 different PFAS, and you think about what uh, are all the others, and they say, oh, well, we can't regulate them as a class because there are so many of them and we don't know what they do. Well, I would re remind them that air pollution is regulated, I mean, PM, whether 2.5 or 10 or even ultrafines are regulated as a class based on number, mass number, not based upon what composes that PM. Dioxins are regulated as a class. PCBs are regulated as a class. There's nothing to say that we can't um, do that, and that's kind of an aside, but it's something that we can begin to think about. We've got to incorporate the non-chemical stressors. Um, we don't often understand what's really contributing to disease and how they act, the chemical and non-chemical stressors act jointly. So just again, referring to kind of the complexity of mixtures, um, we have the complete reductionism where we talk about, okay, I'm going to look at disinfection byproducts in drinking water and I'm going to look at the combination of chloroform and bromodichloromethane. Well, guess what? Forget about all the other things in drinking water. So that's where you reduce it to just looking at two. You can go to define mixtures, and people have actually done studies um, where they've made mixtures as, as many as 50 different, say, chemicals. Um, the problem here is if you look at the combinatorial complexity that you can generate here, it becomes undoable, even in a high-throughput screening kind of approach, or, or a rapid kind of approach in vitro where you're looking at different kinds of uh, mixtures. You can look at some commercial mixtures, but again, in many commercial mixtures, we don't really know what's there. Um, you can do analytical chemistry and find out what composes the commercial mixture, and then you can use that. But I'll, as an example, think of botanicals. The botanical you buy today um, in your health food store is not the same as the botanical you buy next week because it comes from possibly a different source, a different plant, and even though you're looking at the same, let's say, um, Jimson weed or something, it's not the same every time. So, and if you don't know what the active ingredient is, and actually I shouldn't say that because I'm, one major problem we have in our regulatory system, certainly like with pesticides, is all that anybody has to test is the quote active ingredient. And yet that isn't how pesticides are used. Pesticides are used with all kinds of inerts in quotes. Because in fact, in many cases, the toxicity of the mixture is different than the toxicity of the active ingredient, and it can be driven by the inerts. But there's no, no requirement to test that. Anyway, that's just an aside. We can look at source emissions, we can look at, again, multiple sources, and we have this tremendous complexity with leading it to the exposome. So we have all the new tools. I've um, I refer to the talks of the 21st century. Um, I refer to exposure science we, and the human genome, and again, the need for computational approaches. So David's already talked a little bit about new technologies for exposure science, 
And some of this came out of, there was an um, NIH roadmap program called Genes in the Environment, and NIEHS ran the exposure biology program part of it. David was the program official for this. And this program involved different parts of NIH developing different kinds of wearable sensors, um, whether it's for the chemical exposures or the diet and the physical activity or the stress and the addiction, for example, and biological response. And then in addition, there's a whole growing new array of tools that we have to measure the exposome. You know, um, I think for example, using questionnaires can be very helpful in identifying potential sources of exposure or knowing what people are taking. So, you know, how many times, okay, if you're doing an epidemiological study, do you always find out exactly what vitamins people are taking, over-the-counter vitamins, on a daily basis? Do you find out what, you know, really the, the details, not only of their diet, but what kinds of lifestyle that they have. I think there are a lot of things there. We can talk about, and I think we're going to, we're going to hear talks on a lot of this stuff. So the GIS-based environmental uh, models are extremely important. We can have people take pictures of the kinds of things that they're looking at. We can look at biomarkers. I've mentioned the, the issue of biomarkers um, and measurements in different biological matrices. I think we have to start getting cleverer about using things um, that aren't routinely done. I mean, we tend to go to, to, for blood or serum or plasma. Remember, they're not all the same. Um, and urine, but I think we need to be thinking more about exfoliated skin cells. I think we want to think more about, some people do exhale breath, but we might want to think more about the opportunities for other kind of biomarkers and then in the high throughput technologies. So David talked about the NIEHS initiatives in the exposome per se, where we, in 2012, to really ex transform exposure science by enabling consideration of the totality of human exposure and links to biological pathways and creating a blueprint for more exposure science into human health studies. And so we need better improved exposure assessments define and disseminate the concept of the exposome and the tools and technologies. And I'll tell you, a lot has happened, I believe, in eight years going forward. So David introduced to you Cheer and Hear. Um, as he said, what happened when the National Children's Study was, um, was ended in 2015, we actually had one week to write a proposal um, to go to Dr. Collins um, about what we could do with the money. And we were able to con very, very quickly come out with a broad outline of this idea of have developing a national laboratory network uh, that could do both targeted and untargeted monitoring and measurement of biological response as well, and that there'd be a, the data center as well as the coordinating center. And I think that this establishment of this CHEER program really laid the groundwork for here. Um, and the real difference here is that now we, instead of cheer, could only use children's samples or pregnant women samples, basically. This now, any, bio, any biological specimens that had been, um, had been collected under NIH funds, under extramural NIH funds. And I can tell you that it's always been a big issue for um, the intramural people. Yes, Kelly. <laughs> You know, I, I, it's a huge issue, really, there. Um, but again, and then, as, as David said, this has now been expanded to include environmental samples, which I think is a big um, advantage, because we're beginning to understand, again, as much as we like personal sensors, we have to think about ways that we can use other um, kinds of approaches as well. So again, um, under, under here, we're going to be doing, we, this is the royal we, uh, the targeted analysis and the biomonitoring, the untargeted, both metabolomics and some exposomics, and again, exogenous compounds, using all the state-of-the-art approaches under GC and LC separation, all the high-resolution approaches, and at times some of the NMR kind of uh, approaches, and advanced analytical frameworks, um, and development of in-house libraries and online public databases and so on. So I just did want to refer to the Common Fund Metabolomics Program. And again, thank you, Dean Jones, for when he told me about these 22,000, maybe it was 21 or maybe 25,000, but it was at that point in my mind that was an amazing um, number of peaks that he could identify. 
I think he also told me at that time that when we're dealing with metabolomics, the order of magnitude of concentration, for example, of you know, our endogenous um, products, so our, our amino acids, our nucleic acids, our, our, our nucleotide pools, et cetera, are much higher concentrations than most environmental chemicals in our biospecimens. And so you have to kind of separate how you analyze the two, because otherwise the metabolome will totally overwhelm and you'll never get down to the level of resolution that you need. But I think an, the metabolome has a number of continuing barriers that have to be looked at. Um, and are being addressed, and I, I guess I should mention briefly that NIH has been running a common phone fund which is co-run by, N or is partially co-run by NIEHS, um, and continues to be run the second part of it to develop metabolomics um, profiling. Um, the EU, I mentioned, the, e the European Commission Human Exposome Network, and I don't know if we're all Ramun will be talking about that in his talk, but their meeting, which I mentioned um, Chris Wilde spoke at, um, and so did I know Gary Miller um, on February 11th in Brussels, focus on all these new programs that are being developed um, under, under the EU in their 2020 um, framework approaches. Um, there have already been a bunch of EU programs that are looking at different kinds of exposure approaches, including HEALS and the HBM, uh, 4FU and the HERA and the Oberon, and I didn't even talk about the ExposomeNet and, or ExpoNet and a couple of other programs. But the EU, in some ways, I think is way ahead of us in terms of the amount that they're spending and the number of large, coordinated efforts that they have addressing the exposome. They're really looking, and Gary uh, Miller, thank you, I think, for this slide, expanding the ability to characterize the exposed zone with untargeted analyses with both known knowns and known unknowns, and then you also have the unknown unknowns. Um, and then using targeted analysis to feed into helping understanding us there. And then capturing the exogenous chemicals and the endogenous metabolites. So we have the different chemical approaches that are being used. Um, the gas phase analysis that will pick up some of the less polar compounds. The liquid phase analysis that will help us pick up the more polar kinds of compounds. And then, for example, the things that overlap. There's also an approach moving forward for a global exposure harmonization project, which involves validation, harmonization, and standardization, all things that we've heard about from David already, uh, certainly the validation and the, um, as well. But this is trying to get transparency into the data, sh sharing of samples. Remember I said that you can't do this work. You know, as a single scientist, this requires collaborative approaches, requires more bioinformatics. Um, some of the groups that are uh, participating in this in the U.S. is Columbia and Mount Sinai and Emory, the Mayo Clinic, Yale and Brown, and we'd love to have others that join this, and then various groups, especially um, in Europe, are playing leadership roles here. So um, I think when you look at some of the definitions, if you go back to Chris Wilde's original 2005, or you go to the Rappaport and Smith in 2010, um, Gary Miller and Dean Jones, define the exposome as the cumulative measure of the environmental influences and corresponding biological responses throughout the lifespan in 2014. And then just last year, some of the work Gary and his colleagues came up der derived from the term exposure. The exposome is an omic scale characterization of the non-genetic drivers of health and disease. So this was a paper that was just published, I want to say the first week in February, in science, uh, Rawl and Gary are two of the three authors, and I apologize for forgetting who the third author is. But it, whom? Okay. Um, I think he's buried in the middle, sorry. <laughs> but anyhow, I think the important thing here is, again, you're trying to integrate the exposome or ec ecosystems, lifestyle, social systems, and physical chemical, all impacting the health of people. So this is just who I see, and this is a very um, uh, limited, there are many other people who have contributed greatly to the exposome concepts. I would say David Balshaw and Yusha Kui, who are 
the program officials at NIEHS have had a major role in that as well. Chris, the totality of life course environmental exposures. Steve Rappaport and Martin Smith for the internal and the analytical vision. Jermaine Buck-Lewis, an epidemiologist who used to be in the uh, Child Health Institute at NIH and is now Dean of the New School of Public Health at George Mason University in Virginia. But she really brought the epidemiological vision to it and looking at the EWAS kinds of approaches. Gary for his toxicological vision that he has brought to it, the cumulative exposures and responses through the lifespan. I talked about that NRC report from 2012, which I didn't see as strategic as I would have wished, but it did talk about the eco-exposome and ex extended the, con uh, the concept of the exposome from the point of external contact, kind of both inward into the organism, which is how I usually see the exposome, and outward to the general environment. And then Dennis Sargianis for focusing and pushing the need for bioinformatic and modeling kinds of approaches, high dimensional and system science by the data analytics and the bioinformatics. So I think um, one of the things that Rob Ruki, who had given a talk in, um, in Europe in October about the exposome research, he said one of the things you have to do is think globally across disciplines. So again, the needs for multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, collaborative science, expect complexity and you have to harness it. You have to always link to all types of exposure. You have to think about the long-term effects, not the immediate effects. I think very often when we're dealing with environmental health, we're not focused on an immediate acute effect. We're often focused on long-term. You want to try to study exposures mechanistically if possible. You want to look at the interactions and you combine the human and the ecosystem toxicology. So in conclusion, um, I actually took this slide from Chris's talk um, a month ago, the recognized need to prioritize research um, on non -communic, chronic non-communic diseases and focus on prevention is an uh, opportunity for the exposome field. The concept has generated greater emphasis, innovative science, and significant investment in the area of the environment, behavior, and health. Priority exposure disease areas need to be identified to which it can be applied and su need sustained funding. And I'm, you know, was something that we pushed at NIH, and I think I'm very glad to see that some of the ECHO folks are here, and that is also a, a um, the rebirth of a national children's, sit, um, national children's study approach where some of the funding for that has gone into the ECHO cohorts, which are, originally was about 84 different cohorts. I think it's a few less now. Um, but studying children's health from environmental exposures. And some of the challenges here is the information that gets generated has to be understood and has to be used, so it has to be done in a way that we can understand it. We, wanna un we would ask the question is, can we use the exposome concept to identify actions that individuals can take to reduce their burden of problematic exposures? And can we use the exposome as a tool for prevention. And I'll just remind you all that you can't change your genes, but you can change your environment. And thanks to all of you here. And I need to thank, I've already mentioned, Yusha, I don't know what happened with your name. I apologize. Yusha Quay, David and, um, of NIHS, Chris Wilde, Gary Milia, Rora Vermillion, uh, Bob Barocchi, and many, many others who have pushed this field and been willing to share some of their insights with me. So thank you all. <laughs>